welcome to a, welcome to a breaking it all down vlog con report for Kimura Con 2016. So I went to Kimura Con this year. Don't know if I saw any of you there. Um, it's a big con. It's got getting bigger every year. This year it was held at the Oregon Convention Center or Portland Convention Center or whatever you want to call it in Portland, Oregon. Previously, it's been held in Vancouver, Washington, and well. We outgrew the old location, or Comoricon outgrew the old location, in a way several times over. We were already pushing the limits of what the space could accommodate in Vancouver, Washington, with two hotels. And one of those hotels was slated to be demolished. So, consequently, a situation of, well, we have to go anyway. The con has to move. So we moved, so the convention moved to the Oregon Convention Center. It's a very different experience. I've, I've been to cons at that convention center before. Portland Retro Gaming Expo is held there every year. But, this is my first, like, anime convention with lots of panels there. Boy of explanation, Portland Retro Game Gaming Expo is a big dealer's room, a big arcade, and a selection of panel rooms. The, Anime conventions, I always associate more with panels and attractions and that sort of thing. You're going there to watch movies, to watch shows, to hang out with people, to go to panels, to learn things, to see cosplay. Portland Retro Gaming Expo, you go to shop, you go to the arcade. Three-play arcade and the room with all the various systems for, to try out and that sort of thing. So, that's kind of the thing there. Um, for Portland Retro Gaming... So, for Portland Retro Gaming Expo, um, it's also, like, the panel spaces are smaller. There are, like, s three different panel rooms, basically, for Portland Retro Gaming Expo. They also had a fourth room for the museum, but that's pretty much it. For Comorcon, lots more panel rooms, lots more programming going on all the time. So, there is that. Um, interesting seeing the con adjusting to the new space. With varying degrees of success. Port, um, Portland Retro Gaming Expo, they've been there long enough that they kind of know the space really well. They've, they've figured out a lot of strategies for line management, for the panel rooms, and that sort of thing. For Portland Retro Gaming Expo, for a Comorcon on the other hand, there's de or feel like there's a definite, definite case of we are in a new space, we are trying to figure out how we make this new space work for what our needs are, as a convention. This is particularly an issue with how the room, how the convention center is organized. If you haven't been there before, the sort of panel side spaces for meeting rooms and that sort of thing are off in pods. You have a sort of structure, I'll describe it like a hub and spoke setup where you have your big dealer's room vendor area space, the exhibit hall room, basically. And then off that, around to the sides, are a whole bunch of small clusters of, like, three to four rooms. You can vary these sizes. Okay, no, probably closer to okay, three to six rooms, depending on how you, how you configure them with dividers and that sort of thing, off along the sides uh, with these various clusters. Usually there's, like, three, like, three, two or three clusters for chunk, per chunk, um... Or per exhibit hall or whatever. So we're using like three of those. And they were, we basically had them set up as about 16 ish. Like, they were, they were going for the configuration of six, which is still a big room, but in some cases not big enough. And let's go up because we, um, with Portland Retro Gaming Expo this, or the Comorcon this year, I'm getting confused. Comorcon this year, we had some very major guests. In particular, we had, Members of Studio Trigger, the studio who did um, Little Witch Academia, who did Kill the Kill, um, Space Patrol Luluko, Kiz Naiver, Inferno Cop, all those shows there. Also, these particular members also had previously worked at Gainax on Gurren Lagann, on Die Buster, and on Penny and Stocking with Gardabelt. So those people were here, and they're, they're our first big... Japanese, like, that's the first big, this is the first in general Japanese anime industry guests that we've had. 
We also had a big fashion show from a Japanese fashion label. We had a Japanese voice actor, um, a, a seiyu here. She worked on the show Hit Band Reborn as Reborn, which is a show I did not watch, so I didn't go to that panel because that's the, basically the big show, only really big show she's worked on. The only show that, like, I hadn't seen any of the shows that she'd been on. I was kind of wish I kind of wish I got to the panel, but it's like, oh, well, you haven't worked on stuff I'm interested in, and so I felt like would get less out of it. And if I'm not going to get anything on this panel, I might as well let someone else who is more interested in the show and more interested in seeing this voice actress get the seat. So there's that. Anyway, for the uh, so your trigger panel room, they do your trigger probably should have gotten the big room, like one of the larger rooms with the stage, which can seat more people. And I don't and given more visibility and more screens and let people and that sort of stuff. And we didn't get that. It's kind of a bummer. I think they could have sold out a large room, and it helps that the guys from Studio Trigger, who we got, let me bring up their names so I stop calling them the guys from Studio Trigger. They are very good at playing a room. So, the, the uh, we got um, Hiromi... Waki, uh, Wakabayashi and Shigeto Koyama from Trigger. And they play a room really well. They're really good at playing a room. I bring this up because they really made this work. They really made the panel, their, their panels work. It was really fun. It was, um, they, Engage with the audience well, even though there was a language barrier, they're working through translators. They really kept the hype level up, and they were in, it was really entertaining and engaging to be in those panels. Uh, particularly great because they were not able to make opening ceremonies, but they made closing ceremonies, and the whole room was into it. And this was absolutely packed with a little bit of standing room only, um, as much standing room only as the fire code will allow, fire marshals would allow. And that, w that was a blast. That was an utter blast and really wonderful. Um, when I went to KimuraCon, I because this painting behind me, all of that was being done while I was at the convention. So to let the paint dry and all that sort of stuff, I stayed at a hotel near the convention, um, which also allowed me to better go to some late night events, not so much late night panels. That may be for a future year or next year, but Omzi was showing anime films in their IMAX theaters called the Empirical Theater. Um, they've had done similar stuff at KimuraCon in Vancouver in past years. I've never really gone, partially because of time issues and partially because of dr driving from where I live to Vancouver, Washington and back and that sort of thing. But here, because it was so close, I felt more comfortable going to these screenings, which are going to be getting out late nights. So I, they were doing like all day kind of stuff, or at least mostly day to the afternoon, afternoon to evening, late night stuff. And I didn't go to all of it because I did want to go to you know, con panels and stuff, but I did go to some of it. I went to two, two screenings. I went to Evangelion 3.0, and I went to Akira. Evangelion 3.0 is an interesting film. The Rebuild series as a whole is interesting to watch as someone who's also watched all of Neon Genesis Evangelion, partially because of what it retells and what it doesn't retell, and where it's going off the rails. In particular, with 3.0, it is the point where it goes off the rails the most. Where it is, we are in uncharted territory, here there be dragons, and... It makes things really interesting. And it also is neat kind of look at this because it director Hideaki Anno, 
I've mentioned in my Godzilla, in my Shin Godzilla review, how one of his recurring themes in his work is communication and what happens when it breaks down and what happens when it works with his and her, with Kari Kano, his and her circumstances, the anime adaptation of that, focusing more on, here's what happened, communication goes right, everything goes well, we have, we still get wacky hijinks and that sort of thing, but good communication makes people happy and that sort of thing and neon genesis evangelion in a large way is here's what happens when communication breaks down breaks down horribly and when getting into eva 3.0 we are def like there's some of that communication themes coming up in smaller scale in 1.0 and 2.0 but 3.0 is the point where okay communication is completely t broken down no one's talking to each other and here and here's what happens particularly when there's so much on the line and so much going on and you can tell, and in 3.0, it really comes up well, because you can tell when, when people stop talking to each other and stop letting people know what's going on and what's going on and keep their thoughts in their head, then that's when things go wrong. When Shinji and Karu open up to each other and communicate with each other, both symbolically through the piano duet and just through talking and Kaoru showing Shinji what happened while he was in EVA Unit 1 and that sort of stuff, we get the better understanding of... Uh, Shinji gets a better understanding of why things went wrong, why Misato was angry with him and terse with him, why, he had, why the collar was on him in the first place, to a degree. A lot of these things, which there wasn't time to tell him earlier, or no one was willing to tell him earlier, came up here. With... When, when things break down, when there's the bit with the two lances at the end of the film, not I'm staying deliberately vague here, because the film's new enough that spoilers kind of matter. When we, the point with the two lances at the conclusion of the film, we get the whole point with... Kaoru um, saying, hey, something's not right. These are both the same. But he's saying this in his head. He's not explaining this to Shinji, and Shinji doesn't realize this is a problem. And so it makes sense. And so, once again, communication breaks down, and we get the circumstances leading to... Well, it's not too much of a spoiler to say Kaoru dies, because Kaoru always dies. Someone should probably do a shirt or an image macro with, oh my god, they killed Kaoru, you bastards. Something like that. So, there's that issue. And, Rob, and so, there's that bit there. We get, communication cleans up sort of ish at the conclusion. Shinji is once again traumatized and broken, but that tends, this tends to happen to him a lot with every Evangelion property, or at least with the main series and Make the, and here, I haven't finished watch, reading um, Shinji Kari Raising Project, so I don't know if uh, Kaoru dies traumatically there. But with, it, whenever Kaoru dies, Shinji is usually psychologically broken and traumatized and closed off, so there's that. So, there. Um, it is interesting that with the rebuild, with Kaoru, with... I don't know if this is a case of Ana recognizing the passion that the fan base has had for Kaoru, or whether it's this is the amount of time that kind of Ana wanted to give to Kaoru in the first place, but seeing Kaoru going from basically a one episode, not quite a one scene wonder, but a one episode wonder, to gaining so much time and so much more development here, both in terms of of him and his personality, but also time with Shinji and the relationship between the two of them in this film. In the even get in the television series, Kaoru always had a, was at a degree of sinisterness to him that in this film he seems more benevolent in a way. So there's that. I do recommend if you get a chance to watch. Even getting 3.0 at a convention near you on a big screen, definitely take advantage of it. And speaking of anime films I hadn't seen on the big screen before, and ones which you should see on the big screen if possible, the other film I saw was Akira. 
Now, I had seen, this is like my fifth or sixth time seeing Akira, maybe my seventh. I watched it a bunch. I saw it on the Sci Fi Channel back in the day. I, wa I bought the Pioneer uh, Genion DVD release and upgraded that to the Blu ray. Uh, recently, I've watched it several times over. It's a classic of anime. It's a film which definitely benefits from watching high definition. And when I saw that the option was available to see it on the big screen during Kimura Con, I took advantage of it. I ended up missing out on the panel because of this, but that's okay. It's a movie I was looking forward to seeing. And boy, if you if really, if you get the chance to watch Akira on the big screen, take it. It is absolutely worth it. It is a film which really benefits from the big screen experience and from the big screen sound experience. By way of explanation, so the first four or so sounds in Akira are the drum hits on the score. One at the beginning when the we first see Tokyo and we have the date title card. One when Tokyo is destroyed. One when we are seeing the crater, and then one when the main title card comes up. It on a DVD, be it in stereo, on television, or with a big sound system, this is going to be some. You're going to get a certain degree of mutedness to this. It thus it comes across more as minimalistic, which is work is fine. Minimalism works great in the score, and it still has a sense of differentness to it and it it in the film for if you're viewing it on the smaller screen if you're viewing it with the less powerful sound system what these notes say are these are things that you're paying attention to it's, it's here's an image here is something happening here is the aftermath and here is the film's title when you get this on the big screen, when you're getting this on an IMAX sound system, or even just a major motion picture theater Dolby sound system, there is more punch to it. And it's important to mention these are big drum hits, which means it's not just the this is the note. There's bass. There's a bass weight and rumble behind it. And if you've ever been next to you, you understand the power of bass if you've ever been next to a truck blaring or a car blaring rap music with the bass cranked up and you felt your seat vibrate. And it makes a big thing here because it takes those four drum hit, percussion hits and takes them from these are something you should pay attention to and it gives them more emotional impact and more thus it builds a sense of dread and thus when we get that fourth drum hit with the name Akira you now associate those images and that weight with Akira, with that name. And thus, when it comes up later in the film, you get the sense of, oh, it, 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 when you watch on the small screen, it's, oh, Akira is something bad. When you're seeing it again after having those notes, the reaction becomes, oh, shit. Akira is something to be scared of. Their fear is justified, not their fear is informing my reactions to what Akira is. It's a real highlight of sound design, sound mixing in film. So, there's that going for it. And I bring up the IMAX part as well because if you get the chance to watch an IMAX as well, definitely see it. While the film has not gotten a... 4K master yet. So the screen we were watching was in the standard high definition master. So it's blown up. The font for the subtitles was a little pixel. It was a little grainy, not grainy, but a little pixelated to it because of how blown up it is. But the aspect ratio for Acura is the same as the aspect ratio for an IMAX screen. So the film completely films, fills the screen, and if you get the right seats, it will completely fill your field of view, which is great by comparison with films like, well, like for example, the Evangelion film, it's a, meant for a wider screen aspect ratio, um, which also means it's, if you're watching it on an IMAX screen, you're getting a little bit of letterboxing 
And the subtitles, in the case of this release, took advantage of that and went below the portion of the the, uh, the letterbox, below the picture. So it, to a certain degree, it breaks the illusion of the film somewhat, or it, it pulls you out a little bit because you're looking outside of the screen. So there is that going for it as well. As far as pickups and things I um, got at the convention and that sort of stuff, not so much pickups here, mainly because I spent a bunch of money on a hotel room. But I did pick up some stuff. I picked up a card game called Tanto Cuare, which is mechanically, from what I understand, somewhat related to the game Dominion in terms of you have a you have a play field with cards placed in various locations, building, collecting resources, and that sort of thing. The game itself has to do with maids in a mansion. They are two expansions, or two different sets of Tentaquare there. There was the core game, and there was the new expansion, uh, Oktoberfest. I went with the core game, partially because I wanted to get familiar with the core game before I started getting into expansions that introduced new gameplay concepts. I bought something in the first place as well, because they had a promotional card for Comoricon this year, and thought, oh, that's, that's neat, they're doing this, and... I feel more comfortable getting this card if I actually had the game that went with it. But the other bit was... I get that made costumes are meant to appeal to a particular... Guy, for people who are into a particular thing. A fetish or what have you. And into a fetish. And certainly the art design for the game kind of gets into that. There are fan service costumes. But the game... When it comes to the promotional art, when it comes to when I saw the game, there's fan service there, but it's not in your and certainly it's overt about it, but it's not it is it is less pervy about it than the Oktoberfest expan um set is. The Oktoberfest set well says Tentacore is all about the made outfits, the French made outfits. Translate Japanese card game. Um, the set for Oktoberfest is, how to describe the, the look it's going for? It is the stereotypical barmaid outfit. It's the, not just barmaid outfit, it's, if you think about, like, a, if you've seen the movie Quest of the Delta Knights and Mystery Science Theater 3000, or you otherwise think of the bad Renaissance stereotypical barmaid costume with the blouse that really lifts the breasts and like it's it's basically all about the cleavage and showing off massive amounts of it and designed to heighten as much cleavage as possible it's that outfit and it's all about that outfit and ways to make that more and more scanty and i can go with a certain degree of fan service I like, and with the maid stuff, I watch Hayate the Combat Butler. I did a review of Hayate the Combat Butler. And I can kind of roll with the maid stuff. But man, this was a bit much. So, yeah, there's that. Otherwise, other stuff in the convention, I picked up a DVD of... Comic Party Revolution, I own the first original OVA series, figured I might as well pick up the TV show to get the total lot. Got Castle in the Sky on Blu-ray. I love Miss Miyazaki, I recently, uh, last year I picked up a art print ba uh, based on the movie, and figured pick up the uh, show as well. Uh, the art print was for, as a gift for a family member, the Blu-ray of Castle in the Sky was likewise. And I did not get anything signed by the Studio Trigger people, main, primarily because this is my complaint. A lot of the Studio Trigger shows are at any more been licensed by Aniplex, and Aniplex charges way too goddamn much. They have no particular shows that they've had out for a while, like Kill the Kill, like Gurren Lagann. There is no reasonable budget option for the DVDs. There is no reasonable budget way to go Alright, I just want to buy the whole show. 
the show's been there's no, they don't go oh this show has been out we've had this dvd out for three years two three years uh we've gotten a lot of people at the separate volume option let's put together a less expensive box set of everything now much as funimation and sentai film works do and right stuff does just combine all this together now that we've gotten everyone who will buy them right when it comes out let's get the people who are holding off people who can't afford to buy them individually let's do a lower price point thing it seems like Planetplex's option for people who are at a lower who want to watch a show at a lower price point is well you can watch it streaming and then when the license expires you never you won't be able to watch it again so if you actually are really interested in watching it with other people or sharing the show with other people you have to spend shell out massive amounts of money yes i am somewhat bitter i am a person who discovered anime because of libraries because of dvds available through libraries and through anime clubs at high school showing anime on dvd anime and dvd was my gateway having cartoon networks tsunami block tsunami adult on um, their uh, tsunami midnight run which became adult swim with the and, and that sort of stuff that helped having the saturday morning anime block on the sci-fi channel helped but what got me into anime that helped me that made me a fan that made me seek it out and watch more was my anime club in high school and was the library that gave me avenues to expand my knowledge of anime to get more anime a lot of the shows i have on the sh on the shelf behind me which when i do a bit more reworking of my room following the painting You'll hopefully be able to see more of it. But I have like... I have Slayers. I have Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop, they had some on Cartoon Network. They, they played all of it on Cartoon Network. But I actively sought it out because the library had it. And the library had all of it. Same with... Well, Record of the Lotus War. I sought it out because the library had it. Not because it was shown on a cartoon on a sci-fi channel, but they had it. But they did show it. I didn't watch it there. I heard about it. I learned it was a fantasy anime and somewhat D&D inspired. And so I went to see if the library had it. They did. I got the tapes. And then later I got the DVDs. And then I bought the DVDs. DVDs made me an anime fan. And, made, and DVDs work well if I, for sharing your fandom with others. Yes, you lot, everyone these days has a device that has Netflix hooked up to their television. But it's one thing to say, oh, watch this on Netflix. Or maybe, oh, we're going to come over to my place or your place and we'll look this up on Netflix. It's something else to bring the DVD because there's a, an experience to watching something on DVD and a presentation to watching something on physical media that is a big deal when it comes to getting someone to watch something or getting someone into a fandom. Because you have that bit where when somebody's putting the disc in the player, we get to look at the case and that sort of thing. There are all these little elements that make it more interesting and helped and help get someone into something as opposed to, oh, I have to go to your house. I have to log in. I have to enter my password. Please don't look. Blah, blah, blah. There, there's much more of a hassle, actually, to the discovery process if you're introducing introducing someone to something actively introducing someone to something as opposed to just saying oh watch the show on netflix oh watch the show on hulu or crunchyroll or whatever that process is hamstrung without physical media and it also is not helped by if physical if a streaming license expires as what happened with funimation and full metal alchemist Though Crunchyroll has brotherhood, the rights to Brotherhood now, as what has happened with other, with other shows, what happened with some of the Gurren Lagann streaming rights, though those have been recovered in other places, those what happened with those rights, um, when those rights fail, when those rights fade, then it becomes harder to get someone interested in this sort of thing if a show that might work for someone, when those rights go away. Nietzsche Joe, for example, the streaming rights expired from Crunchyroll, and for years you couldn't watch it. Thankfully, Funimation has license rescued the show as of this recording. They've announced that.
but still, it's a pain in the neck. So, there's my little rant there. Um, for the con itself went, again, there are growing pains. The convent, um, it feels like the Kimura Con people are figuring out the line management strategies for the convention next year. I did mention something to a couple of people from tips on line management that I noticed from how Portland Retro Gaming Expo handled the space. We'll see if they do that next year. Also, the other poly tip I'd make if anyone from KimuraCon is watching this is if you have a big international guest or a big local guest, like we had Studio Leica there as well. Leica, the animation studio did Kubo, who did Box Trolls, who did uh, Paranorman and Coraline. They are a Portland studio. They originally started as Will Vinton Productions and then shifted gears and became, and when uh, Phil Knight's son became head of the company, he, um, it became like, uh, that's when we got in Coraline box trolls and that sort of thing, a lot of stuff he directed. So, anyway, they had people there, and their room was sold out, and it was definitely a case of these would have benefited from a larger room space because they are big industry guests, they have stuff to show off, they can seek more people, they can sit more people at their panels. So that is something to consider. Um, going from the Facebook group comments, there were a little bit of complaints of, referring to, oh, we're in the news, where the Vancouver fans were a little upset because they had to come all the way over to Portland, but on the other hand, as a Portland fan, I had to go all the way over to Vancouver, so it's kind of a wash. And there were a few concerns about, oh, it's, it's a ways to go for to, to find food outside from the three immediately adjacent food places that were next to the convention center, which are Burgerville, get four. There's a Burgerville, there's a Red Robin, a Denny's, and a Subway. And I get that. There were, like, even, like, directly adjacent to the convention center, a lot more restaurants. There was a Thai place, there was a Teriyaki place, there was a Subway. Um, plus, there was a, the farmer's market in the park across the way. What this, we may see happen here is, Morricon really started down like in the Eugene Salem area and then moved up to Portland and then to Vancouver and now back to Portland. When a while after Morricon left Eugene and Salem, we got a convent anime convention down in that area, kind of related to the colleges down there. We'll probably get it. That one's still kind of small convention because all the main attention is happening at Morricon. We'll probably get a smaller satellite convention at um, in Vancouver as well in a bit once things kind of shake shake out and the Vancouver fans figure out where, how they want to do this or what have you. Uh, there are a few other complaints about, hey, not giving Kimura Khan in September. I, I I get these complaints. I like having my I like having my convention staggered. Like, back when Kimura Khan was in Vancouver, it was okay, September is my anime convention. October is the gaming, the video game convention, and November is my science fiction convention. One convention per month. It makes it really easy on the budget to plan all this crap out. But, on the other hand, basically what I understand happened is Rose City Comic Con, the conditions of their agreement to use the convention center space, the Oregon Convention Center, is that there cannot be a, a competing convention, which more fits the criteria of, but Port, but Portland Retro Gaming Expo, the less so, because Portland Retro Gaming Expo is, a, is not a media con, it's a gaming specific con. Kermora Con is a anime media con, and like Dark Horse has a booth there and gives does panels there and that sort of thing. You can't have a competing convention within 30 days. And Rose City Comic Con is like middle of September, and Kermora Con has historically been Labor Day weekend, so it's a pain in the butt. Having the larger space, I have no doubt, is probably part of the reason why we were able to get people from Studio Trigger. Having the growing attendee base, which merit, which required the move to the Portland Convention Center, is why we were able to get that, I suspect, why we were able to get guests like Studio Trigger. So you can say, hey, we have this many people here. Not just, oh, you hear it, we have a location that's also close to transportation at the airport. It's really convenient to get to and that sort of thing. The l big space seats lots of people and lots of people there to come see your panels, that's enough to get people interested in coming. So, I get that, so, I get the decision um, to move to the largest space. 
I do think it is somewhat dickish of Rose City Comic Con to have that nine that thirty day prohibition. And if and I'm kind of deciding not to go to Rose City Comic Con in the future, partially because of it. Other than that, um disagree also as well, I kind of get the move. Uh, Kamor Khan has historically been on the same weekend, or rather, not historically been on the same weekend as PAX, but rather once PAX came around, they picked Labor Day weekend too. So you have PAX and Kamor Khan on the same weekend, which leads to people having to make the tough decision of do I go to, Kam- to Pat Penny Arcade Expo or do I go to Kamor, do I go to Kamor Khan? On the one hand, it's harder to get tickets for to PAX, but PAX has more big stuff there and I suspect companies like, for example, Funimation or Discotech Media are probably more likely to go to PAX than to KamorCon, and thus KamorCon is actually probably more likely to get more industry guests. Like, aside from Dark Horse, who is local, we've only had one other major, like two other major anime industry guests in the past. We had, uh, the, um, it was Harmony Gold once when uh, Carl Masick was still alive. And we had Funimation once. Now we have a situation where potentially, because we're not too close to that many other major anime conventions, maybe New York Comic Con, we might get Funimation or Discotech or someone to come to this convention, depending on how we're timed with other stuff. Like... Because also because we're a West Coast con, as opposed to New York, which is an East Coast con, there's the also added advantage of, if we are competing, if we do happen to be the same weekend, there are the advantages of saying, oh, it's worth sending people to Kamora Con as well, because it's on the other, yes, it's on the other side of the country, but that's the point. East Coast people are going to go to New York. West Coast people may not want to fly out that far, but they may be willing to more go to to Kamora Con to go to Portland. And will and they've shown they have the attendee base to make it worth going there. So there is that. Anyway, my Kamorcon thoughts. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.